Hello, this is your host, Jennifer Baker, and welcome to the Human Brain Project podcast, where we talk to the scientists and researchers that have dedicated their lives to solving the mysteries of the human brain. We discover the humans behind the science and find out how tomorrow's discoveries will be shaped. Katrin Amunds is Scientific Research Director and Chair of the Science and Infrastructure Board of the Human Brain Project. We'll be talking about her work to develop ultra-high resolution human brain models. Thanks for joining us. Katrin, let's start by giving our audience a sense of what you're working on at the moment. Tell us what you're doing day to day. So I'm working on a new atlas of the human brain. You can imagine that this is a kind of Google brain. That is, you can zoom in, zoom out, get to microscopical details, and then also have the whole brain perspective. And this is necessary because the brain has such a complex organization, which involves many levels, starting from molecules to cells to large cognitive systems. Well, when you're mapping the human brain, obviously there's a huge amount of effort that goes into that. I mean, what sort of tools are you using? Uh, what sort of high-performance computing, for example? Well, I started with optical methods and microscopical techniques and some image analysis, but then more and more new computational methods came into play. We need statistics, deep learning, and since our data are so big, we also more and more employ supercomputing, that is high-performance computing, to capture whole brain complexity at, at the one micron level. And so then tell us a bit about what might be the practical knock-on uses of this, for example, for medicine or for just better understanding how the human brain works. Well, there are different applications. First of all, we really would like to understand how the brain is organized and how structure and function relate to each other. And since we cannot study everything in one single brain, we, we need an atlas in order to integrate information coming from different labs from different countries and different aspects of brain organization. So that's the first but certainly also we need a good atlas. Uh, we need very precise anatomical maps in order to support brain medicine, for example, neurosurgery, or if we want to better understand where a tumor is located and what are the consequences if this tumor removed. So for all such questions, we need very reliable and highly precise maps. And the last application came in during the last years and that is when we study brain organization and in particular how cells and brain areas are connected with each other, we learn about connectomics, that is how the different brain regions talk with each other. And such knowledge can be translated and is being translated to new artificial neuronal networks or to robots or to other new compute technologies. So there is also a translation into neurotechnology in addition to a translation into brain medicine. Well, I know that when people think of themselves and they think of their own brains, obviously we all consider ourselves unique. What is the the, uh, the tricky part in, in mapping a human brain? Are we talking about a, a typical human brain in full healthiness? Or what about when you need to look at pathologies? Do we need to look at atypical human brains? Is that something that you have to consider? Well, indeed, we are to a certain degree unique. Every brain is unique, like a fingerprint. And this has, of course, consequences also for disease. So rather than mapping the typical brain, we are mapping a sample of brains to capture inter individual variations in brain structure. And then we need, of course, also to consider the very concrete architecture and anatomy of a brain of a patient. And indeed, we see that the progress is being made towards personalized brain models. And this means that these personalized brain models refer to atlas information, which come from many other brains, but also include data from this particular patient. And this helps really to make individual brains and, and apply them for medical purposes. 
This is really a major step that was possible during the past few years. And we hope that we can have such applications for many more brain diseases as currently are being investigated. Well, absolutely. The area of personalized medicine is one that holds a great deal of hope for people for the future. It's certainly something we talked about a lot on this podcast. Let me ask you a little bit about yourself and how you got into this area of study. Was this always something you wanted to do or was there perhaps a pathway to studying the human brain and mapping the human brain? Were there people in your background, perhaps even as a child, who encouraged you down this route? Well, as a child, I did not imagine that I will map the human brain, but <laughs> I was very much interested in biology and mathematics and physics. And indeed, this was a specialization of my school. And it turned out to be very fruitful and important, this combination between life science and neuroscience at the one hand and mathematics and physics on the other hand. And then during studying, um, I was more and more interested in brain organization, in particular in brain architecture, how the cells are distributed, how they relate to each other, and how does this architecture change during the development after birth, then until adulthood. During that time, I also started to work on brains of children who had cerebral palsy, that is a very severe neurodevelopmental disorders. And I became interested in learning more how brain architecture is related to this particular brain disease. And was it all plain sailing? I mean, you, you've... Uh... You've achieved a huge amount in your career. We'll come on to the Human Brain Project next. Um, would you have any advice that you would give your younger self, for example, when you were taking those first steps in studying? This is always a difficult task. When I'm looking back, I feel that persistence is very important because there are many, many obstacles on every career pathway and, and in life. And one has to be confident and, and to stay for, for what you think is correct. But at the same time, it's important to keep openness, to be flexible, to react uh, to something that's coming new and uh, to new achievements and new ideas and uh, to learn to work with others in a team across disciplinary boundaries. You mentioned a team and teamwork and, and being able to collaborate with others is always one of the big responses we have when we ask people what they've found beneficial about being part of the Human Brain Project. Tell me a bit, I mean, feel free to go into detail about your experience in working with the project and, and what have been the bonuses. Well, the human brain is really one of the most complex systems that researchers can address. And it is very clear that, that the comprehensive understanding of a human brain cannot be reached when you are working alone. So, so it's really important to, to have a broad team. And the Human Brain Project has a very broad scope of collaboration among different disciplines, from medicine to neurobiology to cognitive science to computing, math, um, and, and informatics. And this is extremely challenging, but it's also very awarding. I was in a very good situation because as scientific researchers, I was one of the researchers who were able to shape the project and who helped to develop joint projects among the different disciplines and to collaborate between the different research institutions in the different countries. That has been really great. It helped to progress in my own research, but also linked it up with research in Europe and internationally. That has been really a very great journey. Well, tell me a little bit about what success looks like in your field. What would you say is, this has been a really big breakthrough? Is there anything that you're looking to the future that you hope to see um, or something that's happened in, in your career? Well, when we started the Human Brain Project, we had maps of single brain areas and we we have sent these maps to other researchers by email this is now completely different we have a very strong research platform where the data about many many brain areas are being stored and researchers from outside can download it and use it for their own research 
And it's not only the maps that we have contributed, but it's also the information of what is behind a certain area, which cellular architecture with fibers, which receptor architecture or proteomics. So instead of having an atlas that describes only the parcellation of the brain, we have a digital framework that describes a whole brain parcellation and the information that is behind. So it is an atlas that integrates the different facets of brain organization. And that moves us very much forward to a better understanding of cognition and of behavior. Secondly, I, I would like to mention that with the development of even higher models of brain organization at the cellular level, we are able to link the microstructure of the brain again with large scale networks and with cognition and behavior. And our big brain that we have released now almost 20 years ago is a major step in that direction. So linking the different scales really gives us a much better insight of how the architecture of cells is related to a certain function like motor control or like visual processing. This has benefited very much from the advance in computation and computer technology, but it has also pushed the development of new computational technologies, of new algorithms, software in the field of informatics. So really having this win-win situation from the neuroscientific point, take advantage of what has been developed, but also give inspiration and ideas for further technological development. This is, in my view, really a major breakthrough. And I have illustrated this only for one single example, the Atlas, but there are many more in the Human Brain Project. Absolutely. We will talk about many of those in other episodes in our series, of course. Um, you mentioned the big brain was uh, 20 years ago. Talk to me a little bit about the speed of research. And I think you also mentioned that technological developments are speeding things up. Is that accurate? Well, we started development of the big brain 20 years ago, I would say. And we have received a brain of a body donor, have cut it into more than 7,000 very thin histological sections and with very thin, I mean, 20 micrometer. This is like the diameter of a hair. Wow. <laughs> well, and at that time when we started to digitize these sections, we had no idea how to handle them because it was a huge amount of data, one terabyte it turned out. And indeed it took us 10 years to process a brain digitize the sections and reconstruct the sections, remove artifacts that have been introduced during histological processing and provide this data resource to the scientific community. And it came out only in 2013. So now during the past 10 years, we have populated this big brain with a lot of details and information about brain areas, about cortical layers, and uh, about densities of cells, for example, which is very important in order to understand how the brain is functioning. And we have also created a community around the big brain that is using this data set for its own research, for example, to develop models and simulate these models in order to understand the function at the level of cellular networks. This is an advantage or a big step, I would say, but it also took quite some time considering the huge size and complexity of the human brain, which is everywhere one of the big obstacles, I would say, or challenges. Absolutely. Now, I know the Human Brain Project puts a big emphasis on ethics and bioethics and so on. Can you talk to me about why that is so relevant in the work you're doing? I think people get concerned when they hear about research in the brain. There's a, as a lay person, there's almost a little hesitancy. Is this going to expose mysteries? People get concerned about what is consciousness, what makes us unique. Uh, so tell us about the, the ethical framework within which you work. Well, ethics was from the very beginning an integral part of the Human Brain Project. It was from the very beginning a sub-project. And I'm very proud that the Human Brain Project was a pioneer 
in this field before other international brain initiatives followed the same approach. This is indeed absolutely necessary because ethics is not coming after an experiment or uh, a better understanding has been reached, but ethics should be part from the very beginning of our considerations. When we plan experiments, when we, we have from the very beginning to think about ethical implications of, of our work and consider it from a very beginning. And this is also possible or this is also necessary not only for so-called work in the wet lab, but also when we are developing new algorithms and new approaches to store data, to handle data, to develop neuro-inspired new devices. From the very beginning, ethics has to be implemented and has to be part of it. And in the Human Brain Project, we have reached a level, I would say, where this is happening. So ethics has an independent um, structure and organization, but it is also a substantial part of every single work package. Therefore, we really make sure that these considerations are being part of everyday work. You mentioned consciousness. Well, indeed, here we can see that several publications have been published or that several papers have been published during the last few years where we are addressing consciousness also from an ethical perspective. But in order to be informed and in order to be ethical and in order also perhaps to move philosophy, it is very important to deeply understand what is the biological basis of consciousness. And it is extremely important to weight the risks, perhaps, that can be identified against benefits that we have when we study consciousness. And there are lots of benefits when you think about brain medicine and in particular disorders of consciousness, like during coma, for example. So these are extremely important topics. And of course, they are not finished when, when the human brain project comes to an end. So this is also one of the take-home lessons, I would say, that such questions have to be reanalyzed, reinvestigated again and again with progress in research. Well, indeed, I was going to ask you what comes next uh, for you in your career or what would you like to see as the areas of focus for the study of the human brain in general uh, in the coming years? Well, I would hope that we really come to a very comprehensive understanding of the brain that allows to explain cognitive functions and behavior like language or social behavior based on cellular and molecular mechanisms. And also to understand how these cellular or molecular mechanisms contribute to a certain behavior function. I feel that we are making a lot of progress in this respect. The human brain atlas, but also highly sophisticated brain models, detailed brain models that can be simulated are very important instruments also in the future to contribute. And there's a lot of discussion now in our society with respect to the concept of the digital twin. And indeed, brain twins can be an instrument to address important questions in brain medicine. But these are always very dedicated, very specialized models of the human brain that are being developed for a very concrete scientific or clinical task. And here I would hope that indeed during the next years, we can make progress in using information from the ATLAS and then combining it with information from the brains of particular patients. I would also see that the brain twin has to be somehow connected to the body because the brain is not acting by itself. It is part of a human body. And when we want to understand diseases of patients, for example, after spine injury or even diseases regarding internal organs, we need to understand what are the regulatory mechanisms of our nervous system onto these internal organs and how 
the brain is interacting with the spine, for example. So I would see in the future also combined models of the human brain with models of other organs or in particular of the spine. Last but not least, I think one of the greatest challenges is to close the gap a bit between human intelligence and what we call machine intelligence. So machine learning and deep learning is able to solve a lot of questions and very often already now much faster and more reliable than the human brain. But still, the mechanisms behind are very, very different. And we have lots of situations where machine learning algorithms fail. Why this is the case? How can we improve security and safety of such algorithms? I feel that this should go hand in hand with a better understanding of the connectional structure and of the function of the human brain. So I would expect that also here we have in the next year some breakthroughs. Again, I think this is something that fascinates a lot of people, the idea that we may be within striking distance of a general intelligence, artificial intelligence, because that's very different, as you say, from those algorithms that we train to do one or two specific things very well and very quickly. Um, just as a final question, Catherine, let me ask you, what do you do for fun when you're not working? Do you switch off and tell us how you do that? Well, my research is a lot of fun in my life, I should say. But um, apart from this, I like to read books. I love music. I like very much my garden. Uh, I like architecture and traveling. So there's a lot of fun also in the small amount of, of free time. And what bit of advice would you give to any young person who might be listening who would really like to, to follow in your footsteps and perhaps answer some of those questions that we were talking about? I think it's important to do what you like with passion and with, with full engagement. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for joining us, Katrine. And thank you indeed to our audience for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Human Brain Project podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Human Brain Project podcast. If so, please subscribe and leave a five-star rating, and most importantly, share with a friend. To learn more about the Human Brain Project, please visit humanbrainproject.eu and be sure to check out other episodes in this series packed with fascinating insight into how our minds work. Thanks for listening. <laughs>